Welcome back to High Performance Computing, Advanced Scientific Computing. Today we have lecture 10 on parallel and scalable machine and deep learning. Quite a big topic and therefore we have also several practical lectures which go along this very interesting, you know, topic that we have in HPC that is really building on the elements we have had in the course before with MPI OpenMP. We will have some machine learning algorithms that actually use these facets of parallel computing. And then we will, in the practical lectures, most notably uh, dive a little bit into deep learning because it's also related to your last assignment, which is coming up now shortly. And of course, with deep learning, we are also very close to the topic of GPUs, which is a learning experience in that particular topic that, of course, GPUs are just great for deep learning. And we will learn about this in practical lecture 10.1 and practical lecture 10.2 even. But before we dive into the material of this lecture today, let us basically review what we had the last time. The last lecture on nine was basically on graphical processing units. And if you want to have it more broadly, you would say accelerators. And if you look into the top 500 supercomputers today, you see essentially quite an impact of those GPUs alongside all of these systems you see here. The summit system, um, which we also discussed in the lecture a little bit, that you see on the right hand side has even six of those GPU basically per node, um, which is very significant amount um, compared to many other systems. It also shows you <clears throat> that the impact of this GPUs, of course, um, really help to get systems very high up in the, let's say, top 500. And here, even though we learned that V100 cards that we have here are not the, let's say, cutting edge um, today, we still see that basically by having just a lot of them, uh, it can make a big difference. And a lot of them, of course, means different aspects um, in different countries. Here, we also learned last time that the Yuli Supercomputing Center is also quite strong in the top 500, given, of course, the scale of a European um, country which is more or less also the power of European funds and so on. But there we have already NVIDIA A100 cards, which are basically, let's say, the cutting edge right now with the Ampere architecture. And you see here we have four NVIDIA A100 cards per node, uh, basically. And the typical idea that we have a CPU, a host CPU, as you know, as well, of course, that actually then um, basically provides here the access to the NVIDIA cards. Um, the good news is we have here 936 compute nodes, which are all of that kind of type, which means in the end, we have around 3,700 GPUs. So with these GPUs, you can do a lot of work. You can basically um, have lots of different users using the system concurrently, as you already know, with a high number of GPUs. And of course, on the other hand, you also see the impact a little bit in the power architectures so that the power consumptions with GPUs is also something which should be not neglected that they, those systems are usually also let's say they are power friendly and efficient. And the way how you program these GPUs is let's say always a little bit similar um, and we learned also although we're going from NVIDIA away maybe here and there to AMD and other vendors uh, the general principle still remains a little bit that you would have a host CPU, um, which has the CPU memory where you basically load your data in from input output, wherever you get it from a parallel file systems of sort, for instance. And then you put it essentially to the device memory here on the right hand side, we have the GPU device or accelerator device more generally with the many cores that you have here basically illustrated um, that are basically, as we know, not really the high single thread performance that you would expect from the CPU here, um, but rather a moderate um, speed cores, but they have not just very many of them and they need to be scheduled. And of course need to have an interconnect with the device memory and also basically enabling here sorts of level two caches and so on, but not as strong as you really find on the CPU. However, in the last lecture, and you see that here a little bit also in the summit architecture, the device memories, as an example, again, for NVIDIA with HBM, um, but HBM is basically um, not really an NVIDIA-only technology, so we can have this HBM memory, basically, which you see here in the drum, uh, 
also in other cards. And these are providing um, an incredible bandwidth, really, and, and latency together here with these many core systems, enabling a very high throughput. So essentially saying that within the GPU, we don't have really data problems. The rather, let's say, limiting effect we have today and we see today is how we get enough data into the GPU space to enable more higher throughput. Hence, we have seen concept of interconnecting GPUs again, not only with the NV link and NV switches that are basically illustrated a little bit here in this red circles. Also, the idea is to use maybe the host CPU more as a network interconnect device or a kind of network library of sort, and then try to communicate directly between the different, let's say, devices um, in a distributed memory sort of fashion. But this is, let's say, something which um, goes into more details. And I think here for a course on that level, you don't need to understand more, but just take away the message that GPUs really have um, incredibly entered the market in the last 10 years. It changed a lot what was happening before, um, basically without graphical processing chips. And today you would see that almost all HPC systems in one way or another would have some form of an accelerator to it. And I think in the future, because you see here quite an impact of NVIDIA, right here, NVIDIA Tesla V100, NVIDIA A100, et cetera, here, NVIDIA A100, NVIDIA A100, um, NVIDIA V100, NVIDIA V100, and I don't have to talk more, NVIDIA dominates the market right now, but there's, let's say, some competition on the horizon with AMD, as we discussed last time, and with other vendors, uh, potentially also coming from Europe as well. And that was a brush up of basically the lecture nine, which we will also have as a practical topic in a way, because it will be also something you use in your assignment number three. Uh, but of course, uh, GPUs are just, let's say, processing capability. So we want to use this processing capability with some, let's say, real applications. And where we also dive now, basically, in the second part of the course, um, you climbed the mountain, we are over basically all the technical key aspects of this course. Now we look more in the second half of the course into application areas like machine learning, deep learning, health and neurosciences, CFD, systems biology, molecular systems, and then climate modeling, terrestrial systems. So here now the second part of the course will really show you here and there where essentially all of these technology aspects we learned in the first half of the course here are actually applied and where they really make a big difference to enable, for instance, terrestrial systems simulations at scale, or basically to dive in the quantum world of the very small with molecular systems and, and so on. But basically we start today with parallel and scalable machine learning because it is really very close now to GPUs. You would say deep learning in, in one way is just really possible because there are GPUs today. And you will learn this in your assignment when you execute deep learning on CPUs, which is terribly slow. And then you execute the same code from deep learning on GPUs and it's massively faster. Why that is the case, we will learn now during the course of the next, let's say really three lectures. So today I will do an introduction to this topic. Then um, we, I will provide you another, you know, practical lecture 10.1 with some, you know, kind of insight into convolutional neural networks or so concrete algorithms in deep learning. And then one of my PhD students, Rocco Sedona, in practical lecture 10.2, will do deep learning at scale. So really distributed deep learning using a high number of GPUs, for instance, 128 GPUs, just for learning one deep learning model at the same time. So, of course, this is a course for HPC, so I don't really expect that many of you know what machine learning is. Hence, we will start with a very, let's say, simple start what machine learning entails some principles, some concepts really, uh, what classification means. We picked that particular supervised learning model because it's relatively easy to understand. And then we progress there a little bit to linear learning models, which are in a way the, the simplest learning models we have still, but still already can be quite powerful. Then in the second part of the lecture today, I would dive more into, let's say more advanced aspects like the SVM, that is a maximum margin classification strategy or method really that basically uh, builds in some respect on these linear ideas. It just finds the best, let's say, decision boundary. And we will talk about it briefly 
Of course, I cannot give a complete introduction to SVM with kernel methods and so forth, which usually in other courses have taken me perhaps four lectures to talk about. So here we look rather on the implementation uh, perspective because we have an MPI implementation which is scalable and we have used it with remote sensing applications where I then also want to really talk with you and emphasize on the machine learning aspect again, that here in machine learning, the computing footprint in training, testing, and then especially cross-validation, for instance, is, is a very important part why HPC can make a very big difference in machine learning algorithms. And of course, it goes without saying, HPC systems often come with support for big data. So they have large parallel file systems, as you already know from my previous lectures. And then when we see today, big data is existing, people use more deep learning with big data and we will make the case and the connection why this has been, let's say some, some all you know, interconnections with each other, big data needs really increased computing and with this you have basically deep learning. So, and I will of course then stimulate a little bit in these lectures, the next subsequent lectures like this distributed training I was alluding to with Rocco, for example. And with this, you see coming out more to the application parts in the second half of the course towards the end of the course, we fulfill lots of promises from earlier lectures, but now you have a concrete, let's say ground to build on, you know, OpenMP, you know, MPI, you know, parallel file systems, you know, GPUs, you know, all basically we talked about parallelization, domain decomposition and uh, data structures. And now the idea is to little bit look how you can make this happen to be used in different application areas. So really when you coming out of this lecture today, I think again, here and there, the importance of domain decomposition will be an important factor. You can imagine we want to parallelize elements and application parts, even in machine learning. That means in other words, we have to crush the domain basically and decompose the domain if it would be called in order to make it happen to parallel compute it. Then, um, here and there, I provide you with really foundations today in machine learning, which is really a scientific domain specific application area. Um, it's not really based on physical modeling, but many other applications you would see in the future topics. And so it's a very specific scientific domain, but still very valuable because although it's really one specific way of how you can use HPC, machine learning methods and deep learning methods can be used in a wide area of application fields as well in scientific and engineering. And of course, this, this basically the lecture today, you can even say you really program and use HPC programming paradigms, but that what we will see by, for instance, using accelerators and deep learning, or essentially using then uh, this idea of distributed and shared memory on these different algorithms like SVMs and HPDB scan. So because basically I know since the Bologna uh, and so on, we have here people in the course that never had maybe something because of machine learning and what that is and why is there hype in media about this right now. Um, this course now since a couple of years starts really with a very small introduction to machine learning. And here of course goes a disclaimer. Usually I do these, let's say teaching and training for machine learning three days or a whole week. So you can imagine that I cannot bring across a whole machine learning course here. And we have other machine learning courses here actually in our computer science department uh, that I would encourage you if you like this um, you know, topic to go to. Also Hufstein, a new professor here in our division has interesting courses related to data sciences and we in the University of Iceland really do there much more in the future with a data science program really that you can graduate with. It's a very interesting material, very sweet material, really, if you think about how that works. And we start here by a short overview of having classification, clustering and regression. And this is in one way how you would basically group many of these algorithms in machine learning and these models. It's however, not the one and only one how you could do this. So in classification, um, you would have, let's say two different classes here for simplicity already available. And then there comes a new data item of sort into the game, basically. And you want to understand, is that basically a red or a green group member? And you would analyze this and you would do basically, um, uh, you know, you will find with the model, the rule or what we say sometimes the decision boundary to really knowing that this one is more likely to be a red or a green point. 
So clustering, in contrast, doesn't have this information of this red or green groups, but is in a way a little bit um, building on similar ideas that basically these group building can be created by some similarity measures. And that could be the Euclidean distance, for instance, as you see here, these points definitely are closer to each other than perhaps, let's say, these two points. So clustering them, bringing them into a groups um, would be the idea of clustering. And sometimes you even do clustering first. And then on top of that, you would perform then the classification, right? Here you find groups and then you use the groups with new data sets that coming in in order to perform the classification. Now, the third region is the world of regression that we also will partly discuss today. It's not a big word. It's basically meaning something like a real valued outcome if you want. But with logistic re regression, we will also see it that it can be categorical. Um, but here you would say you have simple linear learning models, simpler linear regression, for instance, here to really identify a line or certain slope that describes the data very well. It, I would say it's on the boundary to statistics. It's not really the best learning model that you can have, but still it does a job um, and we will learn why. And when you then look in the broader machine learning field, you will find um, terminology like supervised learning or unsupervised learning or semi-supervised learning. Um, and here today, we really talk about the supervised learning. And supervised learning is characterized by having input data. And I provide you some different examples later. You can always imagine we have this red and green groups here, which are described essentially by um, their position maybe in the space, which makes up here the input data. And the interesting thing in supervised scenarios and supervised learning, you have this guiding output Y, right? So that means here for each of these points, which are described by this vector X, you have the color, which we talk about is a label or the ground truth, which describe that this particular point is a green one and this particular point is a red one. And this is the difference to unsupervised models, for instance, where you don't have any output and where you have to generate then other elements. So hence, this is the supervised learning approach that really tries to predict them um, to the input data here that you then maybe get from new points based on learning from those, um, what this Y will be for a new point coming in here. And basically you learn from these examples in the past and then are able to really do inference and to do this with new points. And then bring us a little bit to an overview also about the compute challenges and also if you want the, the machine learning prerequisites that basically before you go to machine learning, always have to check. Firstly, machine learning is basically the idea of, of catching a pattern. So that you have to assume that there's some pattern that exists in the data, right? Learning from data is the idea. If there's no pattern, if there's nothing to learn from the data, then you don't go for machine learning. Right. Think about a random number generator of sort. It hardly makes sense to do that because the random thing to learn would be not really useful for us. The second point is what is usually not the real motivation is if you have an exact mathematical formula, you just go ahead and implement it. Right. Then there's no point of doing machine learning necessary. Um, examples would be weather prediction, which is largely driven by physical mathematical models. So there basically, of course, machine learning can help here and there in some elements uh, close to the data, but the real prediction based on numerical weather prediction that we will also have in the course later is perhaps better done by re just reusing those mathematical formulas than just using the data because there you have causality, you have the physical formulas proven, understood based on natural laws and natural phenomena. And the third is then really data exists, as I said, machine learning can be seen as learning from data and today maybe even from big data. So if you don't have data, or in some occasions you have maybe just too little data, then also machine learning doesn't make sense. So you have to check that this one, two, three that I have here um, is actually true. There are some patterns, you don't have really a formula yet now, and there's some data that I can use. And big data is a question what that means from when we talk about big data, and there's a whole learning theory um, based on the law of large numbers and so on, uh, leading to something called Vatnik Shabonenki's inequality and, and so on, where you basically see that is the amount of data for the capacity of the model you learn from. But this would be a topic that is much better teach in a real machine learning course, right? 
Um, but in other words, or a simple example is if you want to understand your customers as a startup and you would say, well, we have just uh, five customers right now, but we want to predict the next customers, then you would hardly say that this is possible machine learning because five customers probably don't give you enough information to understand the six or seven new customer. So in other words, um, it depends a bit, of course, on the model you want to do, but you have to have some basic data really existing in machine learning. And you see that this is also not really a new field. It is really shared with applied statistics, particularly in regression techniques. It is shared with modeling and data mining. The Debye scan that we already learned would be in some respects mining for clusters. So it is a huge space here with overlaps, which we today more or less coin as data science with an important part, which is mostly driven by high computing needs these days. So you see that basically you never would be completely sure of saying this is a machine learning method. It can be also data mining method or the statistics methods of sorts. So, and essentially by starting with a very simple problem we go through now, um, and because it's simple, we can go a little bit quicker through it, but you have the recording. If you have questions, we can have also a Q&A session about it. A key question you maybe have is, what is this type of flower in the field, right? You would go maybe with an app, make a photo, and you want to recognize this automatically. What is this type of flower? And now you would say, okay, I had a machine learning system. That means um, I need to learn probably from existing data sets. And luckily we have this here in the, in the ERIS group of data sets, um, basically based on this reference here, where we have already groups of data that exist that says all of these pictures here are Iris Setosa. Let's say it's a red group and the, all of these pictures here are the Iris Virginica, which are the green, for example, right? And then we want to, based on these learning of these images, want to predict what this new flower is. Now, the interesting thing is that um, we as normal people maybe don't really see directly a difference, right? So normally I ask in an on-person class or face-to-face -face class, can somebody say to me what type of flower that is? And only one student in the past could do this, which was, a, I think, bio, um, you know, biology student with a plant-based um, specialization. Um, but in the end, you see the interesting thing of doing this in an automated way would be that many of us lack the skills of really identifying this flower as an Iris virginica or Iris setosa. So how we do this now with machine learning? We basically have a learning problem, which we call a prediction task. Um, we basically have this Setosa Virginica as groups of classes. We will learn from them iteratively through this algorithm I come to shortly. And we also would say it's a binary classification problem. So basically a very simple problem. And now to do this and to see what type of flower that is, we have to look on the data we have. And by looking so, we basically put an emphasis on attributes in the data. Right, so what in these pictures and in these pictures could be attributes that the machine learning system can learn from over all of these different images in order to be, let's say, good enough and to generalize well out of sample, as we would call that, in order to predict this flower right. So, and if you look in this, um, we will find those attributes. And of course, also to put it in the bigger frame of reference of the machine learning, you know, one, two, three checkpoints, you would say, there is a pattern, even if you as normal people can't see it, but the interesting thing is expert directly can tell you, you should look on the petal and sepal width and length. And this gives you an indicator where actually the difference is. Still, if you just look at this uh, for people that are, you know, just normal people like me in this area, um, you know, not having any experience there, they still don't see really a difference. Hence, we need maybe automation we need a system of equations that tells us from that particular length on or width, we call it this or that. And we also know that essentially there's not really a mathematical formula that just says this is a Iris Setosa or Iris Virginica. So also this we have satisfied and luckily in number three, we have now basically a data collection, which is a very famous data collection that when I also bring it here, it's a called the Iris collection of data, which is a three class problem and now you should be warned and said suddenly, well, I talked about a B, basically two class um, classification problem. Why there are suddenly three classes with 50 samples per class? 
And this is just the nature of this data set. I actually have so-called um, pulled one class out and filtered the data set that they're just two classes to make it easier for the understanding. However, if you look in this data sets, you find three classes. And in a machine learning course, I would make a case for it. But here, what you also see then when you look deeper into these classes and the samples that are given, you always have a SEPA length and SEPA width for each of these flower, basically, pictures. And with this, you basically then have also the guiding why. If you remember, a supervised learning means we have the why, the class already given, so Iricitosa, Virginica, or the one that I actually um, have put sampled out, as we would call it, Iris Versicolor, which is a different one that we don't look at here in this particular course. But if you then just simply print those basically on a two dimension, um, you just pick petal width and petal length, for example, from these attributes, which you basically see now as part of being a, you know, basically a vector that is describing then with these different data sets, this X data point here as an example. And you can quickly use the petal length and the petal width to basically have a visual impression already on this data set. And what you basically already see is a certain pattern we talked about, right? So you clearly see that basically it seems to be that one class is having here a cluster and another one is having here a cluster. In other words, they are very similar to each other. Hence, it is the same flower type that we assume. But of course, here are no class labels yet. So we don't know. It's just simple printing of all the data set we have. You know, let's say we have this 100 samples and we just print them here and we already recognize this pattern, right? That this indicates a flower type. Now, when you basically confirm this by just make the colors here, we see Y, which is then essentially our class label saying, indeed, every color from the Iris Citosa seem to have small values here and the Iris Virginica have rather bigger values here. So still, this is not machine learning, right? Don't get confused. This is just a preparation of understanding firstly. With a visual inspection, there is a pattern to be learned. And basically we see that here. And now what machine learning in the simplest case would now try to do is to find a decision boundary here somewhere. You basically, to identify all these points that maybe go on this area of the decision boundary on that area and to identify them as Irisitosa Iris virginica. So I put that here as an example that this could be a line which is of course in the simple linear learning models, um, one line, but if you talk to support vector machines and then later with deep learning, you have interesting decision boundaries, which with kernel methods can be having very interesting you know, interpretations. But let's start simple here, keep the decision boundary, which is I think very easy to understand and see how we can put this now in a mathemic, mathematical notation to make really machine learning work. So, when you have this, let's say, you know, line, you can say, and we know what a line can be modeled or how a line can be modeled in math, um, basically with this interesting, you know, um, you know, formula here, we just have to basically have this, you know, coefficients which we call a weight in machine learning here um, to be changed and basically to be found. X is a constant, that's our attributes of the flowers, so that's easy but we don't know the y, uh, the, the w here. And the same as you know from the equation of a line here is really we have always this, this threshold in a way we call it here. And the thresholds would be important to understand if we are basically above the line or below the line, so to speak, which is irisitosa or iris virginica as class information. So when you put this maybe a simplified idea in a sign, we could say, that for instance, class plus one should be Iris Virginica and class one minus one should be Iris Itosa, which is more or less a compact notation here, building on these kind of equations. And then you're already at the, perhaps the first and the simplest learning model you can actually have, which is the perceptron learning model. And this was basically introduced 1957 from Rosenblatt and you basically see it's modeling sort of a nerve cell um, basically with neurons that you have in the human brain. And as I alluding to earlier, the X is very easy here. That is a dimension in our data set, right? It's from the training data. So this is petal length, petal width, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the guiding Y I also have, which is here on the other side. So this is something where I can have a yardstick 
how far am I away, right? And the interesting that you see now red, here is where machine learning comes in. So we want to learn these weights, right? Here you see kind of a neuron with connections of input stimulus and output stimulus. And the, let's say, um, you know, input combined linearly using these weights would be making then the output. And here and there we use a so-called activation function in later, um, let's say, lectures. Here it's a simple, let's say, sign that gives us plus one or minus one. And the interesting thing is now to find that relationship, right? To basically play around with these models, with these red elements in this equation. They are not known. And we have to find those that actually satisfy, so to speak, our data set that we have. And satisfying means in the supervised output um, that we have basically the input here that you see in these three, for instance, and the guiding output Y. So by just sticking in these, let's say, samples in this particular, let's say, learning model, you can find values that actually satisfy all of these different data sets. So I don't do it now for everyone. I picked here, let's say, two of them where you say um, perhaps in one class, you could say if actually weights have been learned that are now here 0 0.3 in all of them, and then the bias would be 0 0.4. And if you now compute this, you would be at, you know, positive sum of sorts, which as we say with a sine function, then if everything is positive, then we put a plus one. And this is by running it through sample three. And you can do the math if you want with all the others. Let's pick another one with sample six, where we want to have, of course, also another class as an example, minus one here, which has the same learned weights, right? We don't change something. It's the same learning model still, the same learned model, which is a trained perceptual model we can now use for classification. And we do this with this data set in, in basically using just sample six, for example, then we have a negative sum, which in other words, brings us a minus one sign. So, of course, now the key and tricky question in this is where machine learning comes in, how can I get to these red values, right? I have data. I have even the guiding output. I have a learning model now. I know, okay, you know, input some up linearly using weights will do the job in order to get to the right Y. But how can I learn these? And, of course, learning suggests something like iterative aspects. So iteratively learning from the data. And with this, we go a bit more into this idea, what could be now the idea of this threshold and playing with the threshold by iteratively changing this. So you can imagine if you remember basic math and linear algebra and so on from, from earlier work, hopefully from you in the studies, you see if you change these Ws and the threshold particularly also, you will see the situation will change with the line in the space. Right. So in other words, we play with the line and the line is shifted along in space. Here are two examples where you say each green space and blue space are regions which would have then the minus one or plus one as an example. Right. So and by playing around with this line, you can imagine we can position it in a space where from the visual illustration, we will find a correct decision boundary like here with these points. And if there is now a new point landing here in the green space, we can probably say with some confidence that's actually plus one, that's really this class, or it is in the blue space, it's the other class. So in other words, we learn this results by iterative learning, um, basically that we have seen today. Before that, um, this is 0 0.3, which is not given to us. We have to basically learn this. And this is where machine learning now with the perceptron learning algorithm comes in. So we have a perceptron learning model and a perceptron learning algorithm which usually is used then to find basically as a very simple learning model then these particular thresholds. For mathematical convenience, we can also incorporate this threshold in. If you do a little bit of mass here, we just define that this threshold is basically another way to learn and define that our first X in the data site where we won, then we have a much more compact notation. And some of you know that basically this construct here um, if you look at it in detail, it is actually a dot product, which we can then co more compactly write as a dot function. And then we skip the sum, so to speak, which you sometimes have seen maybe as W transpose X. If you're basically a vector vector, um, you know, multiplication or as it is called here, the dot product, right? The W transpose is nothing else than 
basically putting this vector basically then as a column vector here. But the key message remains the same. We have to learn this W values, right? And this is now what we stick in the so-called persistent learning algorithm. So we have the sign from the W transpose X that we want to learn. And the perceptual learning algorithm that we basically see here on the right-hand side now will do the following. It will always take one point and play around with it and see if it is correctly or not correctly classified. So you see that with these two outputs here with Y. Um, and basically, if that's not the case, and it's basically not really correctly classified, then we adding or subtracting a vector based basically, as you see here, a little bit on this plus one and minus one Y. That's why basically the orientation of the vector changes so quickly. And by iteratively doing though, and if the data is really linearly separable that you see here, the line will be found. It will be 10,000 iterations. It will be maybe 20,000 iterations. It depends. It's not at all that it's always the same convergence. It depends on the data set. But if the data is linearly separable, the perception algorithm will do the job. And here you have seen now really the, the simplest learning model that you can get. And by iterative changing the weight here, right? By iteratively going these steps, again, by adding, subtracting this vector based on the data I have in question, you basically come to a convergence. However, if the data is not linearly separable, let's say here were red points and here are blue points, the whole thing doesn't work again. And you need the pocket algorithm and others, basically, that we don't took here in the course today. So, and by having this W learned, you directly have this line, right? You now know exactly in space where that is. And with every new point, like here for an example, we can now finally conclude what we start in the beginning. We say it's below the line here, below a decision boundary in space. So machine learning with a prediction task can now take advantage of this learned line and actually do inference and predict this and say it is an erysitosa here, for instance. So, and this is a key essence where many of the machine learning you know, algorithms work with. Of course, there are much more elaborate algorithms. Um, here's one example, an advanced application example, where you have, let's say, an example of a binary classification, which is of a different sort of nature. Here we want to know if the food inspections will actually fail or if they will pass based on basically um, you know, a check report. So basically something where people have talked about what are the problems, the kitchen is dirty, um, you know, the food is always smelling. So in, in one point of time, you would see these all are attributes in a way in the text that can be also learned by a machine learning algorithm. And there's the same idea. You have these violations in checking restaurants as a pattern which somehow influence the, our judgment of pass or failing. And of course, there's no mathematical formula. It smells like category 7, 7.5, and then suddenly uh, we know exactly that this will be failing the inspection. So there is no mathematical formula. However, we have data as an example here from the city of Chicago where you can now apply this and predict basically for new basically restaurants based on this quality violations if it will be a pass or fail in the future. And there are different algorithms how you can do this and work with this just for you as an overview. Um, and connected to some of the future lectures is linear classification, which we just talked about, right? Simple binary classification, hopefully linearly separable. Then you, may, you have a linear combination of the inputs, you know, summed up using weights here, which makes then the perceptron learning model. And you put that through the perceptron learning algorithms in order to learn now this Ws. Linear regression then gives you more a real valued outcome. Instead of saying the sign that where is a plus one or minus one, or failing and passing the food inspection or erysitosa or iris virginica. Here you now have a real valued outcome that could be, you know, basically something where you spend money and you want to basically know of how much factors you spend here will influence maybe uh, basically then the marketing sales of your product by, you know, increasing maybe the TV advertising or newspaper advertising and so forth. So for those models, linear regression is good. And then when you have, let's say, a more categorical, um, you know, idea of an algorithm, um, you can have logistic regression, which we have in a short video, um, which would be perhaps then one that is often applied really for classification as well, where essentially you squash these 
elements which you get out here in the real value then through the so-called logarithmic function here that you see so that you end up with values always between zero and one giving you a sort of probability of sort of where you're standing in these classes but then of course can can also um, you know for candidate fail and pass can quickly you know identify based on this probability um, if it will be a fail or a pass and to understand that better i brought you here a guy which i think explains it rather good in a very short amount of time but of course i encourage you also to study this topic more in the future hi everyone i'm max Morgan, and i'm here to talk about logistic regression logistic regression is a classic statistical model for classification basically we take a multiple linear regression where we have our dependent variable is a function of many independent variables, each with their own unique coefficients and an intercept term, and we stuff that inside a logistic function. The logistic function squashes the output of the linear model so that it remains between zero and one. Effectively, the output of a logistic regression is a probability value of whether our inputs belong to class zero or class one or whatever arbitrary pair of classes that you decide to feed into the model. One of the main points of convenience with the logistic regression is interpretability. The coefficients that we get out of a logistic regression directly quantify the influence of each individual independent variable on the output, as with a multiple linear regression. In the case of a logistic regression, the parameter that you get out, you can exponentiate in order to get the odds ratio for that particular independent variable. So basically, if you hold everything else the same, the odds ratio tells you how much an increase in the output probability you get with an increase in that independent variable. In order to pick which model you want to use, you can use a variety of traditional techniques in order to select parameters for the model. This includes information criteria like AIC and BIC, which penalize additional parameters that don't add additional information. You can also use just plain accuracy percentage to see how many of the classes that the model predicts actually line up with the classes in the observation. There's another method for classifiers that you can use called the area under the receiver operator characteristic curve or the AU rock. The ROC curve is a plot where you plot the false positive rate on the x-axis versus the true positive rate of the model on the y-axis. You eventually end up getting this curve and you can take the area under it to determine how good your model is at differentiating things. Generally a value of around 0.8 is the area under that curve is a good benchmark. If you're looking for a model that can classify more than two classes, you can extend a logistic regression to a multinomial regression where you predict any of a number of different classes. That's a little bit beyond the scope of this video, but if you're looking for a basic classifier, a logistic regression is a good place to start. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. I think, um, as, as I was alluding to, I think he explains it quite nicely in a very short amount of time. And I think here it is also a good source maybe for look more up, um, you know, what, what kind of machine learning entails. Specifically on logistic regression, as the guy told, I think the input relationship to the output relationship. So how much you increase in TV advertising gives you more sales to understand that, or would you rather put it in newspapers? Right. So to have this relationship is a very nice property of this model. And with a linear learning model, still linear in weights. But right? what we learned, linear in weights makes it a linear learning model. We will see in SVMs later, that's not the case anymore. And we will basically go to other learning models uh, very soon with deep learning. But I stop here essentially as the first part of the lecture. And we continue with the second part of the lecture, seeing how that not all fits into HPC.